Um, I am extremely excited to get our program started today, so I'm, I'm just gonna say all protocols observed. For those of you who don't know me, I am Joanna Banks, and I am a Senior Vice President of Panjam Investment Limited. I've only worked at Panjam for three years, but somehow I've gotten away with announcing and introducing our most exciting news, and today is no different. So I'm very proud to welcome you to the Mars Facey Lecture Series. We expect this to be the first in a long-lived series that highlights timely and important topics. Today, we will discuss the cost of chaos, envisioning a resilient metropolis. We'd like to make this event interactive. Um, as such, our friends at um, the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, or CAPRI as some of us know it, have enabled us to use an online audience interaction tool for the submission of questions that I will ask our keynote speaker later in the program. In order for you to use this, you're gonna have to have access to the internet, and I believe my friends are gonna put a slide up to show the Wi-Fi password and how we can ask the questions. All right, Wi-Fi, okay, there we go. So you'll see at the top of the slide, um, it says the network that you're looking for is JCC, Jamaica Conference Center, and the password is one that I am not going to say out loud. Um, but I will tell you that the, it's capital R and that's a zero, not an O. I'm going to give everybody 20 seconds to do this. All right, I think we're good to move on. Once you have that set and you have access to the internet, you're going to browse to slido, S-L-I-D-O, dot com. It's gonna ask you to enter um, an event code and it's going to be MF Lecture, Morris Facey Lecture. Um, once you get there, it will allow you to type in your questions um, and enter them. It's asks you if you'd like to put your name. You do not have to, your questions can be anonymous. And once you enter your question, the other participants in the room will be able to vote on your question um, thereafter. And these questions will be what um, I will ask our key speaker after he speaks. We will only have 15 minutes for Q&A. So I encourage you to enter your questions as soon as you think of them. Um, with all of that out of the way, I'd like to welcome Panjam's chairman and CEO, Mr. Stephen Facey, to the podium. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, it is indeed an honor for me to be here today and at this very important occasion for, for us at Panjam, um, and we hope that it will be the start of a very interesting conversation that will help us to build a better city for ourselves. Today, we inaugurate the Mars Facey Lecture Series, which underscores Panjam's continued commitment to the creation of a resilient urban environment not only in Kingston, but all across the island. The Morris Facey Lecture Series has been named after my father, a man who believes so much in Jamaica's future that he created Panjam shortly after our nation's independence in 1962. A true patriot, he continually invested in Jamaica and her people, determined to help build a Jamaica for all of us to be proud. Under his leadership, Panjam participated in the distribution, finance, hospitality, manufacturing, tourism, and real estate industries. He pioneered the development of high-rise commercial and residential properties all across Kingston. And over the years, Panjam grew to be one of the largest publicly listed companies in the Caribbean. 
My father also had a vision for the restoring, for restoring downtown Kingston to its former glory. A vision that Panjam continues to pursue through the development of the Rock Hotel and residences right next door. Some of us may still remember it as the Oceana Hotel. But we felt that we need to do more to honor Morris Facey's legacy, a long-term commitment to making Jamaica a better place to live, work, and do business. My father's devotion led him to the establishment of and participation in major planning organizations, including KRC, Kingston Restoration Company, and Tourism Action Plan Limited, which today we know as the Tourism Product Development Company. And through the Morris Facey Lecture Series, we hope to continue his work and emphasize the benefits of proactive, long-term planning in a new context of dynamic and sustainable urban development. But we at Panjam cannot do it on our own. We need the support of all Jamaicans who embody bold action, key insights, and strategic and innovative thinking. If necessary, we are determined to introduce and lead a new kind of conversation about Jamaica's sustainable development. As participants in the series, you are breaking ground on what we hope will inevitably be the cornerstone of conversations that will provide a framework for shaping our country's bright future. The minds behind this series have glimpsed this bright future, and we feel inspired and compelled to share it with everyone for the benefit of all. We've seen the works of our neighbors and understand the context within which improvement is possible. And perhaps more pressingly, we have searched the world over and have seen the constraints that simply require an evolved way of thinking. It is estimated that half of humanity now lives in urban areas. And the expectation is that by 2050, Developing world cities will gain a further 2.3 billion people, tripling the urbanized land area in the developing world. In the global context, this concept seems exciting. We look at some of the world's great cities, those to which we aspire, New York, London, Paris, Singapore and see large populations living, working, interacting almost seamlessly in general. In general, we think that these cities as the centers of diversity, wealth, and opportunity. The importance of a resilient urban environment cannot be overstated. Over the years, the development of cities and urban centers has been driven by a collective desire to connect. We all believe from being closer together, we have access to shared resources, job opportunities, better health care, and many other benefits. Of course, there are costs. When I think of New York City, I think of traffic, exorbitant rents, and crime, all components of the cost of chaos. Nothing is perfect. Harvard University's Paul Glazer is a passion urban economist and describes the city as mankind's greatest invention. He states that the part of cities that magic, that's magical occur in the chains and collaborative creativity that occurs when smart people learn from one another. I think he's right. Cities are the tangible expression of who we are. They encapsulate our unique cultures and highlight the best and worst of their citizens. In that vein, we have to ask ourselves, what do our cities say about us and our country? Do they represent our aspirations as a nation or the limitations of our past? Over the last 40 years, we have talked about and pursued economic growth. However, we have focused only on its fiscal components while accepting the results of subpar infrastructure management and poor planning. Fortunately for us, we are at the cusp of true urbanization in Jamaica. This is an exciting time to be Jamaican. Confidence in our economy is returning, and we are primed for investment in various burgeoning industries, and we are nowhere near exhausting all the available opportunities. 
Now is the time for us to leapfrog into a new way of thinking of development, to have a proactive planning process that endeavors to create the types of cities and towns that we want and need. Mr. Glazer also states that productivity per capita goes up about 15% when population size of a metropolitan area doubles. Thinking about that, just having more people closer together increases our collective ability to create and produce. So our urban environment stands to have a profound impact on our nation's long-term growth and wealth creation. Prolonging the current state of our urban environment, including our reactive approach to very real aspects of development, can only serve to inhibit our ability to grow in any meaningful or sustainable way. The creation of wider streets and overpasses has done wonders to improve our movement throughout the city. However, we have to invest in the infrastructure that is needed to support increased density, including the development of transportation hubs, reliable water distribution, effective sanitation management, and public green spaces, all with a view to protect our environment. Our cities need to be efficient. As Mr. Paul Roma, the 2018 Nobel Prize winner for econom economics, argues, the power of cities to lift pe people out of poverty dissipates when cities don't work. The population of Kingston is currently greater than one million and growing. Is Kingston ready for the two million residents? Moving forward, we must establish an organization with the skills and authority necessary for the development of the ideal metropolis for Jamaica's unique context. We have the ability to use, utilize technology and case studies to envisage what that would be like. We have the ability to examine our current state, identify our shortcomings, and address them. And as members of the public and private sectors, we should have the desire to collectively create a forward-looking development framework that will enable our upward trajectory. We expect that the vision and insight of Dr. Pedro Ortiz will help to fill the gaps in our strategy. Recognized and held in high esteem as one of the world's leading urban planners and strategists, Dr. Ortiz is a pioneer of metropolitan planning. He was Madrid's deputy mayor for strategic planning, mayor of the central district of Madrid, and then director general for regional planning and urbanism for the Madrid regional government. He was in charge of the Metropolitan Plan of Madrid from 1996 to 2016, as well as the previous strategic plan of 1994, where he integrated the fields of environment, economics, transport, and housing under the scope of governance. Sounds like just what we need. Dr. Ortiz has, was also an Eisenhower Fellow in 1998. He is no stranger to Jamaica. He penned the pro-positive analysis of the Kingston Spatial Plan for the World Bank in 2011. But today, we look to Dr. Ortiz to reconcile his analysis of the Jamaican urban environment with his insights into overcoming the challenges of urban development. So we invite you to think critically about the future. Our collective responsibility to our urban environment and the role we want to play as stakeholders in a future that actually exists. Please help me to welcome Dr. Ortiz to the podium. Well, Stephen, you have said it all, so I don't know why I should uh, give a lecture now, because I'm going to repeat your own words, which are absolutely correct. No? Well, I, I want to thank you, uh, to thank uh, Panjam and uh, the Maurice uh, Fosse lecture series for this invitation. I met uh, Maurice and Valerie nine years ago in Washington, and I immediately fell in love with the couple, a wonderful couple. No? So I am very proud of being the inauguration uh, these lectures. Jamaica's flight. Uh, this is not a very sexy uh, uh, slide, but in red 
are the uh, metropolis of the world with a GDP. And in black are the countries of the world with the GDP, the highest, ranked from the highest. And as you see, the metropolis of the world are as powerful economically as countries. No? Country number 15 will be Tokyo, or 14, 14 Tokyo, 15 New York, 20 Los Angeles, Chicago, London, Paris, etc., etc. Out of the 100 most powerful uh, territorial units in the world, 46 are already metropolises. And if you take the next 100, of, uh, something like 60 or 70% of them will be metropolises. So metropolises are as powerful as countries, and that is going to change the shape of the world. Because those metropolises are the representation of those countries in the world. If the metropolis of a country doesn't work, the country doesn't work. We will see later on a slide where you have uh, the different types of countries. And there are countries where the metropolis is 60%, 70%, 80% of the GDP of the country. So if that metropolis doesn't work, the country doesn't work. So that's what is at stake in, in the future with our metropolis and then with Kingston and the metropolis of Kingston. If you see comparison uh, of countries uh, and metropolis, you see here that the GDP of Argentina is similar to the GDP of Houston. I said that in Argentina not long ago, and they told me, if you say that again, we won't invite you anymore because we hate the Americans, and we want one. Colombia is like, uh, like Atlanta, and so on. Los Angeles, San Diego is like Spain. Madrid is like Peru. Paris is three times Colombia. So the world is going to be run by metropolises and not just countries. And those metropolises are extremely productive, more productive than the rest of the country. This slide shows in the left the urban system of France and to the right the production of the different areas of France. The more blue are highly productive, the uh, more red are less productive. And you see that the map uh, matches exactly. So metropolises are more productive, uh, cities are more productive than the rest of the country. In countries, where that, countries that work, and metropolises that work, that productivity is around 25-30% more than the rest of the country. Uh, that's the case of London, 30%, Paris, 25%, Madrid, 20%. No? In countries that do not work, that productivity is either the same. In India, some metropolis have the same GDP as India, uh, $2,000. That means that the metropolis is not efficient enough because economies of scale must make the metropolis more efficient. Or in other countries like Guatemala, the metropolis is 400% more uh, uh, efficient than the rest of the country. That means, that I, uh, again, that it doesn't work because the metropolis is not being able to use the hinterland of the country to integrate that hinterland within the economic system and there is a huge gap between the two. And uh, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur is 1,000 times, 1,000% one, more efficient than the Malaysia. No? So really that doesn't work. So we have the limits and it is a must to make our metropolis, to make Kingston work because it's Kingston that is going to put Jamaica in, in the, in the uh, picture of the world. You mentioned, Stephen, this uh, graph, which is the, the growth of the urban population and uh, the stagnation of the rural population. Uh, countries that are developed, and that is a requirement for development, uh, do have 75-80% of the population living in cities and only 25-20% of the population living in the countryside. And that is uh, unavoidable. No? I remember 30 years ago, institutions, uh, uh, multilaterals, were uh, trying to keep people living in these small villages. And we in Europe, with uh, a wealthy economy, we uh, produce all the uh, social facilities that were needed even in a small village. In a small village, of 50 people, you had a school, you have a teacher, you had a van that will take you, an ambulance that will take you to the nearest hospital. You had all the social facilities, and in, st in spite of that, people moved to, uh, to cities. Because cities provide something that the villagers cannot provide, which is hope. 
hope for an improvement, if not for you, at least for your children, and then you move to cities. And there is as well economic reasons, no? When you uh, grow the uh, income of the rural population, you can only grow that income when you capitalize the countryside and when you technify the countryside. And if you do both things, you need less people in the country. And uh, that extra people, which are not needed, move to the city. So it's unavoidable. That doesn't mean that if you have urbanization, you will have development. No? Because we have in Latin America many countries that are into the range of 80% and are not developed. They have GDPs of 4,000 or GDPs of $6,000 per capita. No? So urbanization doesn't mean development, but development means urbanization. And we have to understand that. You mentioned that in the next uh, uh, 30 years, we are going to, uh, to move 2.5 billion people from the countryside to the, to the uh, metropolises, to the cities. And as a matter of fact, every day, 300,000 people are moving to, uh, to the uh, metropolis. So imagine that you have to build Kingston in a week, and next week another Kingston, and next week another Kingston. For those of you who know New York, if that was the rate of growth of New York, uh, that will mean building 10 blocks every day. So really walking down Fifth Avenue with a fairy stick and just uh, sticking, uh, hitting the ground and then having the, the whole block built up in, in two hours, each of the blocks of New York. So it is a staggering. And it is the first time in the history of the world that we are seeing that. So it's a new phenomenon that we never experienced before. There has only been in the history of the world three cities that were 700,000 inhabitants to one million. No? And that was Julius Caesar in Rome. By the way, they, he had traffic problems. He had, he had to make uh, a special bylaw for uh, freight uh, and distribution for, for the uh, trucks, uh, obviously with carts, uh, with oxes, but uh, he had a traffic problem. Then Beijing of the Ming Dynasty in the 17th century. Then London of Queen Victoria. No, from, she started with 600,000 inhabitants, and when she died, it was 1 million inhabitants. Three. Now we have 500. And they produce 75% of the GDP of the world. So really, if 500 produce 75%, you could say, well, let's make another 150, and then we don't need, need the rest of the world. Just the metropolis will be enough. Obviously, it's a joke, no? But the issue is that from 3 to 500 is a new phenomenon that has appeared in the last 70 years, since the uh, Second World War. Before that, no, it was uh, relatively contained. No? So it's a new phenomenon, and we do not know how to manage it, and we are learning how to manage it. I gave uh, once a lecture, and my daughter, which was 14, was in the uh, audience, and at the end I asked her, uh, have you understood something? What is the... Uh, the the uh, uh, synthesis of what you heard, I say, that your generation is going to leave a world in a mess to our generation. No, our generation is really leaving a world in a mess because this is a new phenomenon, and we have to learn to develop that. And even if you think that it's beautiful to live in the countryside and you should not move to the cities and you have an, a moral attitude to it, no? which is fine, but uh, that will not stop the process. Uh, you must understand that the process, as I mentioned, is not only the, the countryside is being capitalized and technified, is as well that, as I mentioned, that the metropolis are much more efficient than uh, villages and small cities. And why? It's because of economies of scale. You know? The larger you are, the more efficient you are if you know how to manage it, if you don't fall into chaos. You know? And this is an example of four countries, uh, France, Germany, Netherlands, and Spain. This is the number of petrol stations related to the size of the city. No? So you see the size of the city in the ordinances and then uh, the, the number of petrol stations. If the number of petrol stations was proportional to the size of the city, it will be a line that will be 45 degrees because you increase, you double, and it, then you double. No? And it's not. The slope, as you see, is slower than 45 degrees, is less than 1, 1. No? That means that it's more efficient. The larger you are, the less petrol stations you need. 
So the money, the capital that you had to, build, uh, to, to spend to build those petrol stations and the people that will be working on those petrol stations are doing something else that will produce more than being in those petrol stations. So the capital and the people will produce more. And that is the competitiveness of the metropolis, and that's why the metropolises are growing, and that's why people are going to the metropolis. And this is not just uh, urban phenomena. It is in metabolism, no? If you have a species of an animal which is double the, uh, the, the size of another species of animal, and I don't mean being fatter, I mean really doubling the size of the species, that species will be 15% more efficient than the, than the other animal. So, and again, if that was a proportionate relation, you will see it will be the red line, no, which is one to one, but no, the slope is a smaller. That means that the double the size of the animal, you have 15% less consumption. And by the way, as you can see, women are more efficient than men, but we know that from, from other reasons. So. So this is a metabolic, this is a principle that applies not only in economics, not only in urban, in metabolic. And if you double the number of administrations managing a metropolis, you reduce by 6% the efficiency of that metropolis, which is the same proportion. Uh, if you double the number, you reduce by 6, uh, 6 to 15, is, uh, you double or you uh, divide by 2. And this is directly apply, uh, applicable to Kingston. If you have 10 municipalities instead of one organization running Metropolis of Kingston, and, and when I talk about Kingston Metropolis, I'm thinking not only about Kingston, I'm thinking about Mendeville. Mendeville is the name? Mendeville as part of the Metropolis of Kingston. For me, the Metropolis goes out to Mendeville. If you have 10 cities instead of one institution, then you will lose the capacity of competitiveness and so on. So that's why, as you mentioned, Stephen, you need... Um, a, a system, an institution that will manage the metropolis. And this is a, a book produced by uh, IDB uh, and, and UN, UN Habitat and so on. No? That doesn't mean that you have to invite another two million people to come to live in Kingston. No. no. That means that what you have is to create the transport structure that will make a single market. And instead of leaving one million and one million, it will be living two million together into a single economic and social market. And that is what makes the efficiency. The example I give to the, to the right with these uh, small squares, if you have eight municipalities disaggregated, every one of them producing 100, you will have the addition of that, you will have a production of 800. But if you link them together to a transport system, you will have that multiplier effect of 15% every time you you double, and you will end up with 62% more efficiency. I remember in uh, Caribbean, Colombia, in the north, 10 years ago, uh, I suggested the, uh, the governor to, to link Cartagena, uh, Barranquilla, and Santa Marta, no? and with a train that will unify that metropolis, which is more or less one million and a half uh, people in each one of these cities. No? And just by, uh, by connecting this metropolis, the GDP will increase by 15%. That meant $6 billion per year. The cost of the train was $3 billion per year. So the return of the investment was in six months. Imagine an investment whose return is in six months. It's absolutely wonderful because normally when you're in 11 years, you are in the limit. Six years is wonderful, six months. No? The problem is not the economics, the problem is the finance. The guys that invest in the train, which is the government, is not the one who benefits directly, it benefits indirectly in the second uh, loop, but not directly from these six billion people. It's the private sector that benefits from that, those six billion dollars. And so how to recuperate the three billion you have invested is a financial problem, it's not an economic problem. And I, I am thinking about Kingston about that. No? Obviously, size is good. Maybe you don't agree, but size is good if you know how to manage it. Because if you don't know how to manage it, and then you run into uh, chaos, then you get into the congestion first and the gridlock 
later. And this is a graph that shows how efficiency increase until a moment that you have a limit, and if you don't have to manage that, then it decreases, and then you get the gridlock. And we see that in traffic, no? The, the uh, streets are empty, and you can put more cars in the street. There is a moment that you put an extra car, and all the other cars will uh, drive much slower, so you have reached that top level of the beginning of congestion, and if you go on putting cars, at the end is the gridlock and no one uh, advances. So this is in traffic, but it is as well in many. And there is two ways of increasing the capacity of a metropolis and to managing it. There is the way of investing in more infrastructures to create more space, no? because the infrastructures create space, or to manage better the infrastructures that you already have. So it's either management, and that is the red curve. No, you are increasing the capacity through management, either by, by management or by investing. And that's the way of managing a metropolis. So if you say this metropolis is too large because it's a chaos and it's a mess and nothing is produced and we are in a gridlock, is not because of the size. It's because who's running the metropolis, which does not know how to do it. But... New York, Mega York, New, Mega York goes from Washington to Boston, is 44 million people. So imagine Kingston with uh, 2 million, no? If you have to multiply by 20, 22 to, uh, to find, uh, to have. Uh, Beijing, now they are thinking about uh, making a, a, a metropolitan unit of 250 million people. And Guangzhou is uh, the Pearl River Delta, 64 million people, no? And when they are thinking about that unity, it's because they are thinking of managing the whole thing together, managing the size thing together, instead of having 200 municipalities, uh, every one of them going on their own. And the proof that this management, integrated management, is efficient, you put the example, I, I'm going to refer to your words because you really <laughs> said everything I'm <laughs> going to say. Singapore, no? We uh, generally put Singapore as an example of a well-managed uh, uh, metropolis. Democracy is not exactly right in Singapore, but anyway, uh, as a well-managed metropolis, and it is because it's a metropolitan state, a metropolitan nation. So they really integrate all the policies of health, education, not only infrastructures and land use, it's really the whole system which is integrated that makes the efficiency of the metropolis. This is uh, the list of the wealthiest countries in the world per capita, no? And as you see, the, the, the top ones are all city nations, no? Because they integrate in a city the whole mechanisms. And then you have the others, and Singapore is there with $56,000 per capita. When the countries around them, uh, Malaysia and so on, they are in the range of $4,000 per capita. So you see, 10 times more because they have the capacity to have an integrated development. And look, those two maps are at the same scale. And the top one is Singapore, and the lower one is Kingston Metropolis, that goes to Mandeville, no? So you see, you are in the same kind of scale of uh, physical planning, and then there is a possibility of making of Kingston really a metropolis that will put Jamaica in a different dimension in the world economy. And as I mentioned before, there are three types of countries. No? The countries, I mentioned just the, the, the first ones. No? Egypt uh, uh, with Cairo, uh, Manila with the Philippines. Uh, yesterday in the BBC they were saying that Manila is in uh, traffic chaos and they are confronting the government because of the lack of public transport and so on. So Manila is 66%, uh, uh, Egypt is 60%, Argentina, Buenos Aires, there are figures that say 80%. So if these countries do not work, in these countries, then it's very difficult to have a, a government of the metropolis because the mayor or the governor of that unit controlling 80% or 70% of the GDP of the country, next day he will say the president of the country, go home because I am the one who is running the, the, the country with 70%. So in these countries, it's very difficult to really be able to get an organization unless it is an organization directly under the control of the president of the country. Hmm? And uh, think about uh, Jamaica. Then you have the other countries, which is very easy. Germany, Italy, China, USA, 
where the metropolis are 5%, no? uh, Shanghai is 6%, uh, uh, the, the f 20 metropolis of America, the 20 top metropolis of America, produce 12% of the GDP of the world. So in 20 metropolis, uh, so almost 1% each of them. No? So in USA, uh, I don't remember, it was in the previous uh, slide, uh, uh, New York, how much is the proportion, but they are in the, into the 5%, 6%. Rome is 6%, uh, Shanghai, I mentioned, is 6%, Germany. In those countries, it's very easy to have metropolitan governments, no? Because it's not a threat to the president. 6% is not a threat, no? And as a matter of fact, in Germany, as you know, some of the states in a federal situation, no? Uh, some of the states are uh, uh, metropolitan states, no? Uh, Bremen, Hamburg, and Berlin are states on their own in a federal system. That's not the case of Jamaica. And then the, the intermediate countries, France, England, Spain, as I mentioned, 30, 25, 20, they have to find a way, and they have found a way of organizing the mechanism of the metropolis. So, but we are in, in countries that really need uh, to, to organize it. The, those metropolis. And there are only three ways of organizing those metropolis. The confederate way, that you put all the mayors together and they have to discuss the future of the metropolis and, and try to find common grounds and common policies. The, in the other side, the centralized way, the ministries in the capital decide whatever they are going to invest in the different parts of the metropolis from the, from the center. And then two intermediate uh, situations, which is the federal system, where you find a way that the metropolis have a government. It's not just adding up the mayors. It's really a government where the mayors are included, are part of the government, and, but they do not rule. The difference between a confederation and a federation is that in a confederation, the different units are sovereigns. And in a federation, no. Sovereignty is in the federation. That is, and we have had in the history of the world, you, you see, what we are confronting with the metropolis has already experiences that go back 3,000 years, 6,000 years, and we can learn from that. No? In the history of the world, there has been many confederations. The uh, Athenians, the, uh, the Greeks, were a confederation. The Hanseatic League in the north of uh, the, in Germany was a confederation of cities. The United States, when it was founded, was a confederation. They became a federation later on through the Civil War, no? but was a confederation. In Latin America, there have been many confederations, Peru, Bolivia, Central America. Even in the passports of Central America, you have the whole countries because they remember the confederation status. No? And, these, uh, and the uh, European Union is a confederation. And confederation might work for a certain time, but at the end they don't, and they dissolve. They might be, that certain time might be 300 years. The Hanseatic League was 300 years. But at the end, confederations do not work because when a decision is, is made that someone doesn't like, and let, let's imagine a confederation of the municipalities from Mendeville to, to Kingston. When you make a decision and some of the mayors doesn't like it, he takes his papers, goes away, and leaves the confederation. And the next decision maybe ha would have benefited him, he's away, and harms someone else, so he takes his papers and goes away. No? So at the end, you end up with one member in the confederation, which is generally the capital city that everyone else hates, because the mayor of the capital city thinks he's the emperor of the uh, metropolis, and everyone doesn't want to accept that. So a confederation uh, at the end doesn't work. And a centralized power, when the minister of health decides from from, from his ministry, where to put the hospitals, and the Ministry of Roads decides where to put his roads, and they don't match. The hospital is here and the road is there. That doesn't work either. So the two ways you can uh, uh, approach the metropolitan in, in this kind of between around the 33% of the GDP of the country is either a federation that requires giving power to the metropolis, and, and, and that is a limit in political terms, or a decentralized, uh, a centralized delegated system, decentralized unitary system, which is the president, or in your case, the prime minister, appointing someone that will coordinate and organize the metropolis, trying to coordinate all the investments that are done by the different administrations in the metropolis. That's the case of France. 
France is a unitary system. The president of France is elected as a president. And then in each department, he appoints a delegate, which is called the préfet. And the role of the préfet is coordinating the investments within that department to make sense of the roads and the, uh, and the hospitals that instead of being uh, decided in Paris, they are decided by the different representatives of these ministries in that department to make sense of that. So these are the uh, four systems that can run in a metropolis. I am not saying which is the best one for you, but think about and, and discuss that. A metropolitan, uh, a metropolis is a different scale, is an animal of a different scale. You see here, uh, who of us, sorry, of us, I am an architect, who of us is, are architects? 10%, oh, 5%, civil engineers, geographers, all of the civil engineers over there, all right. <laughs> so they are a lobby. Uh, <laughs> Uh, geographers, economists, lawyers, the rest, who are you? <laughs> anyway, for civil engineers and architects, uh, they, they will very easily understand this. No, we are dealing with different scales. When we design a, a house, we design it at, at a scale 150. When we design a square and some streets, we design it at scale 1500. When we design as, as a village, a city, a small city, we design it at the scale 1,500. When we design a metropolis, we design it at scale 150,000, a country 1,500,000, 1, a continent 1,5 million, and the world 150 million. So every time you grow by 10, the scale of involvement. And you, know, you, you, don't know, you, you, uh, you increase the scale, but you change as well the disciplines required for approaching that kind of design. No? When you are in, a, in as an architect, you are with the structures, the installations, the light, uh, the volumes, and so on. And when you start to grow into the city, you, 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 you include a civil engineer, and then sociology, and then politics. And then when you go up, and you are getting to macroeconomy, and so on. And when you are at the world, uh, you are dealing with geopolitics and macroeconomy. No? So the disciplines are different every time you change scale. That's why we architects, I'm sorry, nobody's perfect, uh, we architects are lost when we grow on scales because those are disciplines we have never dealt with and we are just used to the disciplines around architecture, urban design, and urban planning. But we must integrate that. And space is integrated in those space. Disciplines change. And the client also as well changes. In a architectural, is an institution or is a family, and then you go into the local uh, authority, the municipality, the uh, nation, and when you are at the world, is the uh, White House, the CIA, and the Chinese Politburo, the clients of that kind of approach. And all that approach is related to all the scales. I was involved in uh, the design of an area close to the mouth of the Panama Canal, uh, Panama, Panama Canal, and the Chinese were interested. You know? They were getting involved because controlling an area close to the Panama Canal, they were controlling the, the trade between the two coasts of the United States, and they were interested in controlling that. No? I am thinking about the port of uh, Kingston, no? which is one of the trade routes to the Panama Canal. So it's geopolitics when you are dealing with that kind. You might be designing the planting of the trees or the uh, shape of the, of the streets or the amount of housing, but it's geopolitics because it's interfering with all these scales at the same time. And the dialogue of the scales is absolutely essential. You cannot plan a city with small-scale designs of urban planning. You have to see all those scales and integrate the dialogue between them. And that works not only theoretically in planning. For instance, these are the different modes of transport that you have to integrate in a metropolis, from the airplanes and the airport to the uh, high-speed trains, to the commuter trains, to the BRTs, to the tramways, the buses and the matatus, the vans, and so on, the, and the bicycles and the pedestrian. And as you see, no mode is better than the other one. Each mode is good for something different, and you have to integrate all those modes. I don't go by plane to Montego, but I don't go by bicycle to Paris. No, 
every uh, uh, a mode is, is uh, meant to be, and what you have to do in a metropolis is to integrate those modes, and uh, there are intermodal stations and so on. Sorry. The efficiency of that approach makes that, and these are figures from uh, London School of Economics, to the uh, left is the population density in the structures of Delhi, Bogota, London, and Tokyo, and to the right is the transport system of these four cities. And as you see in Delhi and Bogota, the transport system is extremely poor. They only have in Bogota is a mess. They only have the BRT, uh, the Transmillennial, that they tried to introduce 10 years ago. And obviously, for a metropolis of 9 million inhabitants, it is clearly insufficient. So you have riots of people confronting the police because the uh, BRT doesn't work. And you see those lines, red lines, and only one single uh, administration, which is the local administration. And you see in London or in Tokyo the complexity of the network, the different modes of the network. And the network goes beyond the metropolis because they are serving this population which are beyond the metropolis. And obviously, the difference is $6,000 per capita in Delhi and uh, $73,000 per capita in London. What do you prefer? To have $6,000? or to have 12 times more GDP and money in your pocket or in your bank account. So that is the difference of the capacity of a metropolis to be planned as a whole. And if you don't, that is the cost of chaos. The cost of chaos of New Delhi is 6,000. Is the difference between 73,000 and 6,000. Eight years ago, I was invited by, by Eisenhower Fellowship. Uh, thank you, Maureen, where are you? Hello, thank you. I came for the first time. I love the country. I love Jamaica. I think you have a lot of potential being this uh, Anglo-Saxon related country in the middle of the Caribbean. And I did an analysis that I'm going to share with you the eight years ago and the, with the analysis I've been doing uh, lately. By the way, at the end of the uh, presentation, someone asked me, uh, how long did it take you to make this analysis, because we have been discussing this thing but for 30 years, and uh, we have not reached a conclusion. How long did it take you to, to, to get that analysis? And I had the wits to answer 57 years. No? <laughs> now it's, it was, sorry, 59 years. Now it's 67 years for this analysis. No? So uh, 30 years is not much, but uh, if you increase the pace, uh, you, will, you will be much more efficient. No? So, uh, the previous image, you are not growing as fast as many other metropolises in the world. Many metropolises are growing by 5% every year. When you grow by 5%, that means that you double the size of the metropolis every 14 years. Imagine if you have to build Paris or London or New York in 15 years, the figures I gave before. That will be an impossible task. No? So it is possible, but we don't know yet how to do it, but it is possible. So you are not growing as fast as those metropolises. Why? Because you grow fast when you are attractive. When people want to go to your metropolis because they will find a job, they will find a better way of life, and so on. If you are not growing fast, it's because you are not attractive enough. I, I don't know. That's a question for you to decide because I, I don't know enough about, about Kingston and Jamaica. To, but that's strange, no? But when you see the local developments, no, you see all harbor, in 1991, it was 17,000 people. In 2010, it's 78,000 people. In 2030, it's 167,000 people. You have there this kind of explosion. It's not growth. It's explosion. And you deal with explosions in a different way than you deal with growth. So that's why we need a completely new technical way of dealing with it. I don't have an image, but uh, it crossed my mind. Managing a metropolis, like uh, a city is like a worm, no? It's, it's 15 centimeters, no? Long and so on, it has this uh, lengoated shape and so on. A metropolis, when that worm becomes a metropolis, is one meter and a half, no? Is not anymore a worm, it's a snake. And if you pretend to manage a snake as you manage a worm, you're in trouble. And a metropolis is neither a bunch of worms. It's not many municipalities together in a bunch of worms. It's a snake. It's a unity which has a larger dimension. And that's why all my previous 
message it has to be managed now. So uh, this, this growth of these uh, municipalities uh, are, are really important, so that's why they have to be integrated. Metropolis and in Europe, uh, the metropolis are not growing in the inside, in the center, because the center is al already consolidated, you know, is already built. They are building in the, in the outside. So when you see these figures that say, well, it's the medium-sized cities which are growing. No, no. is the cities around the metropolis which are growing, and they are middle-sized, but they are integrated in the metropolis. So it's the metropolis which is growing. It's not the middle-sized city. So you see the, uh, here uh, Old Harbor and the others which are growing very fast, so they have to be integrated in a common vision of the metropolis. These are uh, uh, shows that uh, Kingston is not growing so fast. You are only growing at 1% uh, population, which is very low. So I will wonder why that is happening. And then you are uh, having a, a, a phenomenon which is terrible, which is the disaggregated, uh, the uh, smallpox of the metropolis. No? The uh, housing states that grow everywhere, unconnected, and they have all to go by car. And I don't know what is your actual ratio of car ownership. I guess you are in, like, the, the countries around you, you are in 1.5, two cars per 10 people. But development means seven, eight cars per 10 people. So imagine Kingston with four times more cars, and cars coming from all Arbord and, and uh, Mandeville and so on and so on. Imagine four times more car, and then the people which now are going to the Collective taxes, how you call that? The matatus in other places, no? Imagine instead of 12 people in a small uh, van, 12 people driving their own car, so 12 cars around. So really, that, that is a terrible situation. So uh, uh, eight years ago, I, I saw that you are a metropolis which has a reasonable size, 55 kilometers, and you have a train system that you have inherited beyond two, 3 million. You, uh, metropolis require uh, a rail system to be organized. So you still have some time to think about it. But you really must start planning for the time you will need that rail system. And in other countries, when you are uh, developed and wealthy, from 1.5 million onwards, you really can use a metropolis. You have to pay for it, so you have to be in some way wealthy to, to, to be able. But really, after 3 million is an absolute necessity, but you can start thinking about how to build that metropolis around the rail system. So you have a rail system that goes to the center of the city, and that you tried a few, the, the, you tried in uh, 2011, you tried to put it back on, on tracks, and uh, it did not work. I don't know why it did not work. You have the stations there, so really you have a, an asset which is essential that many metropolises around the world do not have it. If you take uh, the metro and the commuter train out of Paris and London, it will become Bogota. So really, uh, you have there an asset that can put you into the first world rather than being into, into the uh, uh, Latin America context. No? And then you have to protect the areas that have to be protected and that cannot be negotiated, they have to be protected. Then you have areas of expansion of the system of housing that will be related to the train, so people will not take the car to come to Kingston, they will take the train to Kingston. So there are areas of possible expansion that do not infringe on the quality of the environment, and you have to keep the environment flowing in between the cities. Out of the five systems of uh, metropolitan planning, transport, environment, housing, uh, uh, productive activities, and social facilities, two of them are continuous systems that cannot be broken. Transport and environment. You need the environment to flow to you, the doorstep of your house because that way biodiversity will flow into that environment and you cannot break the environment. If you have a park surrounded by houses, that's not environment, that's a flower pot. It's like having a floor pot in your terrace, a bit larger, a scale 1,500, but it's not really environment. The environment has to, to flow, so in Washington, you are driving in Washington and you find a deer eating your flowers. No? You are mad about the deer, but at the end, is the deer has come through the parks into the city, and that's what makes the environment wealthy. So you see the green lines that uh, separate. The cities should not merge, should not merge. The legislation in Northern Europe, in Sweden, in Germany, and so on, 
prevent cities merging and creating a barrier that will prevent the environment to flow from north to south, from the sea to the mountains and vice versa. So you have to prevent that. Then, obviously, the system of roads that you have now, which are polluted by entrances and exits and so on, um, have to be uh, improved. You have to make a, a high... You have already made... I was trying to... I was discussing that eight years ago when I came, the highway, the T1, the highway that goes, was not built. Hmm? I've been told that it was probably built, but I don't remember that, uh, that highway. So I suggested at the time, because really is what makes sense, that that highway, instead of being in the south, should have been in the north of these uh, municipalities, because that highway would have been the barrier that those municipalities should never uh, overpass invading the environment which has to be protected. So it should have been in the north, you made it in the south, because at the end you will need another one in the south. So you started with the south, that's fine, no? But uh, it would have been better to, to work on the north. So you see, and then those two highways have to be connected among themselves uh, for, for, for to avoid collapse of one of them and to be able to compensate one with the other. So uh, you have the, and, well, this is, I did this uh, yesterday, you know. This is the new highway, the, uh, the uh, orange line is the new highway that you have built, no? Built by the French, uh, Bouygues, I've been told, no? By the French. It is fine in Central Village and Spanish Town because as you see, they go further and so you have the units of the city that can go, you can walk or you can take your bike or you can take uh, as a small transport to the station of the train. But then the highway goes along the line of the train. That should never be like that. The train is to provide passenger transport to the center of the city. The SNCF in France, 60% of the revenue comes from the train banlieue. And the, the, the train should have housings around. Housing, high density housing, 30,000 people. So they will fit the train. Uh, there is TOD, uh, Transit Oriented Development. Have you heard of, of it? The professionals obviously have heard. Transit Oriented Development is a fashion that uh, the, um, well, uh, the Americans call it that way since 1993, which is creating housing around the train stations to have people, instead of taking their car, taking the train to go to the place of work. Well, that was done by London and Paris since 1850, 170 years ago. No? because it was the train uh, companies which were private. They realized that to fill the trains with people, to be able to provide the service, they had to create housing states around the station so people will use the train. And that was called urban centralities, and all the big metropolises of the world that work are created like that. A train system with housing beyond 30,000 people around the train station. So if you put a highway around the train station, and then you have to cross the highway. No, that does not work. So the highways have to be separated to allow for the housing to get around the train station. So uh, the, the design of the, the highway, they were not planner. They were uh, uh, highway designers. So they were not thinking about the relationship between transport, environment, housing, productive activity. And they made what was easier for them, which was to put it along the uh, railroad and, and that's what they did. But that is not the best way to do it when you really have a vision that integrates all those aspects. I'm sorry for that. But it doesn't matter because that highway in the future, in 50 years, can become a boulevard. We can put trees in the middle and so on, and we can make <laughs> the right highway further away, and as you see in the dotted line. So there is always solution to the mistakes taken by, by others. No? Uh, so I was... Uh, but that's the, the same image, the growth of, uh, of Old Harbor. So eight years ago, I even suggested how that has to... This is an image of eight years ago. I don't know if it has grown more. So you have the train, you have the actual road, you have the creeks, the rivers, uh, they are in, in white. So you have to protect those rivers, they have to be clean, they have to be protected. All the land uh, around should be parks and then the growth of the city should be as close as possible to the train station so you can walk or take a bike to the, uh, to the uh, station. So that's the area, and obviously the mountains that have to be protected. So that's the area of development of Old Harbor, 
This is the, uh, the, uh, the highway on the north, the highway on the south, the connection between the two highways in such a way that if a truck uh, has an accident in one of them and that highway is stopped, you still have the other one. You must always have to be resilient by having a plan B and a plan C to any kind of movement. And then I, I even went into Kingston, the new Kingston and the old Kingston, how to relate the two of them. Sorry. So I did this uh, diagram. As you see, all Kingston, new Kingston has to be integrated with a, a strong uh, transport system. By the time, maybe it was a tram system, a BRT, uh, I don't know, but that's up to the planners, transport planners. And the two have to be related to the, uh, the tail of the, of the uh, kite that is a Spanish town, uh, Old Harbor and Mandeville and so on, in a, in, in a system. So I, uh, the connection between new, new and old Kingston, Kingston and the metropolis have to be connected. The waterfront and the old town have to be redeveloped and regenerated. In the metropolis of the world, uh, to make the, uh, the presentation short, I did not uh, mention how those metropolis have to work, because that will be a, a long lecture. No? But in the metropolis of the world, we are changing a concentric system, an orbital system with radial roads for a reticular system. We are changing, we are not playing any more dots, we are playing chess. We are not all trying to be in the center because the center has more value and then all collapsing when we try to get with our cars to the center. We are playing chess with a polycentricity, many centers that uh, are specialized, each of them. And so uh, in, in, in that way, uh, you, you can multiply the accessibility and you are, every one of the squares of the chessboard has a different function to play. And as in the chess, one is the king, one is the queen, one is the pawn, one is the bishop and so on. The old center of Kingston is the king. And if you lose the king in the chess, you lose the, the, the match. So the king has to be protected, has to be enhanced, has to be cherished, and has to be, is the essential piece to protect, but it's not the strategic piece. The strategy of the chess is not made by the king, it's made by the queen, again, woman. Uh, it's the queen who has really the structure of movements that can control and can articulate. And generally, the queen in a metropolis is the area where um, international business is the relation of that, with the base economy, what you export. So it's really what makes the wealth of a metropolis is what you export. No? And the more advanced you are in economy, what you export is not products that are heavy with low value. It's products which are very expensive with low weight. In, in the area of San Francisco, in the Bay Area, where you produce all the computers uh, that we have, they don't take the boat because they will arrive to the destination when the new generation of computers will be in the market. So really, they all take the plane because it's two thousand dollars per kilo, no? And around the Bay Area of uh, of uh, San Francisco, there are fourteen airports. Fourteen, one, four. Two of the three of them are passenger airports, and the others are freight airports. It's just to provide the basic. So you. Uh, when you will grow into a developed economy and you will put your products into the international markets with a high value, you will be less uh, dependent on the boats and you will be more dependent on, on, on the plane. And obviously, the actual location of the airport uh, is difficult, especially when by the end of the century, probably the, the sea level will go two meters high and then we will see what, what happened with that airport. So I invite you already to think about a larger airport, where to put it, and how to put it. So the, uh, the structure of uh, port uh, business and tourism, tourism network, obviously, from the port, the waterfront, what you are, where we are now, and, and, and or, uh, organizing the tourist uh, system. No? So this was the connection between the two centers that have to be done by a public transport with capacity, as you see, linked to the train station that li links the commuters, so you have the whole metropolis done. Today, eight years later, I have been in internet, I've been looking what uh, you are doing, probably I have missed many uh, things because the internet 
has 99% of the information around, but there's always 1% missing. And I have found this list of projects, which are all great, no? but they are in a dimension of 1,500. I have not seen the dimension of 1,500. I have not seen the dimension of 150,000, neither 150,000, which is the country. I have not seen this dialogue between scales. No, I have seen projects which are small, which is like this waterfront, which is great, but it's not related to the center, to the other center, to the rest of the metropolis, to the station, and so on. So I really miss that. No? And when I went into the page, page not found. No? So really... So uh, this, is, this is Jamaica. No? And let me make a diagrammatic analysis of Jamaica. No? This is the diagram of Jamaica. And why are these diagrams useful? We call them mental maps as well. Because for the engineers in that, the crowd over there, uh, it's, it's like an isostatic roof truss. No? And in an isostatic roof truss, you need all the bars and all the knots for the truss to work. If you take one knot out or one bar out, the whole thing falls. No? So a metropolis is the same thing. You, you need the structure to work in a consistent way with all the elements. If something is missing, you have to build that something because that is needed for the structure, the, the, the mechanism of the... And in Madrid, the, in the top, uh, the, the green uh, rectangle with the other was Madrid. In Madrid, we had one million people living in one side of Madrid and two million people living in the other side, one million in the center, four million, and they had not a connection that was missing, the M45. So we, d we said, we need to make the M45. And we did the M45, and the M45 took 240,000 cars out of the ring road of Madrid, which is the M30. And we changed the structure of Madrid. Instead of doing more ring roads and more ring roads that just create more concentration and more congestion, we created. And in the other case, well, it's an example as well, no? an emoji. Well, if you see an emoji and the, uh, an eye is missing, you will say, well, we have to design the eye. So then you design the eye and you put the eye. And in the, in the right of that is uh, uh, Santiago de Chile, uh, tw 20 years ago, I went there and I say, well, this is the structure of your metropolis and this train is missing and they have built the train. It took them 17 years to build the train, but they have built the train. No? You know that an, uh, a highway takes 12 years to build, you know, 10 to make the decision and 2 to build. <laughs> Politics is complex and founding and so on. An airport takes 50 years, 35 to make the decision and 15 to build. So really, 17 years for the train, uh, that's, that, that's fine. No? And, uh, so for me, this is Jamaica, no? with the mountain in the middle and the uh, main roads and the main structure that crosses the other side. So immediately, what I see is that you must promote the, the rhombus, the, the main rhombus that goes from Montego to Ocho Rios to Kingston to Mandeville, that, that rhombus. And I did, I did this analysis before I knew that you had already built the highway uh, to, to, to not yet to Mandeville, but in the future to Mandeville, and the other highway that goes to the north, you have already two sides of that rhombus, so you really uh, must create the, the rhombus. So the, the train, the commuter train to Mandeville uh, has to be as well uh, done. I say second phase because for me, the train to Old Harbor is already on. I, I, I think uh, eight years ago was a, a must, uh, so it's uh, still a must. Uh, the international position of Jamaica through the port, the airport, and the metropolitan integration, that is a must. If Kingston doesn't work, Jamaica doesn't work, and that is a national issue. It's the central government that has to uh, realize that and has to get involved into that. You have the tourist north coast with the ecotourism and integration, that you can promote that because you have a wonderful uh, uh, environmental asset and, and quality and then the environmental protection and sustainable energy production. I think, I don't know really, but I think that your high mountains, and you have a really a very special country compared to other uh, uh, islands of the Caribbean, and I have a map about that, no? Uh, your high mountains will be able to produce a lot of eolic wind energy and so on. I don't know why you are not developing that. Now this, this is uh, exaggerated. This is the... Uh, high rise, the, the level, the sea level rise of uh, more than six meters, and that can take place in 150 years, so we 
probably some of us will see it, but not me. And, and as you see, Jamaica is the one of the uh, islands which is less affected because you have high ground. So Cuba is going to disappear. Maybe Guantanamo is, uh, will, will stay there. But, but you have really a potential of that you are not under such risk as many other countries and many other metropolises around the world, so you have to use that potential of growth. So this is the diagram the of, of, uh, of uh, Kingston and the Kingston metropolis. You see the straight line of the train, you see the two lines of the highways, you see the connection of the highways north and south, you see the development areas that have to be contained and high density to to, to destroy as, as little as possible of the green fields around the areas and uh, to keep the agriculture. And you have there to the left a potential of ground for economic development and myself I would put an airport there. Not a passenger airport, a freight airport. No? But to be the alternative to the uh, passenger airport when it will be under collapse and you will be uh, selling high quality goods or with low um, uh, weight and you will need uh, an expansion of the airport, and I will uh, think about that. And in such a way that you will have the infrastructures used in both, in both ways, not all coming to Kingston and going out of Kingston. You will have the uh, metropolis with a polycentricity, with many activities along the way. And so this is uh, the, uh, the diagram. This is the, uh, the, the diagram without the map underneath. So this is the structure of Kingston. and so. In 2011, I mentioned priority and urgencies, Spanish town commuter train, all harbor access control highway, orderly housing development in central village, Spanish town, all urban, uh, and urban eco-social TOD centralities. Now, eight years later, I say the commuter train has to go up to Osborne store, Mandeville access with a control highway, Montego West Island crossing, so the, the crossing not only uh, through the central of the island, but at the way the old train used to go, the old tracks to Montego used to take that uh, line because it's a natural line that can be regenerated to connect and to have the, the rhombus of the, of the, of the uh, uh, island and the, and the country. Orderly housing development, now further away, Freetown, Maypen, Osborne, Storm, Hayes, Industrial development in West Hayes and the freight airport in West Hayes. No, I've been told there is an airport there. I've been, uh, I've seen in Google Earth that there is a small airport there. No, with the runaways north south. So if you take the plane, you you crash straight into the mountains. The runaways probably have to be in the other direction, but you already have a, an airport there, so it's a possibility of freight airport. So the uh, Kingston has the function dialogues. I am just. Remembering, um, these are the, f the final uh, slides. Uh, the new and old Kingston, Kingston Metropolis, Waterfront Old Town, Port Business and Tourism. So that's, that's urban, that's not metropolitan. That's the basic, that's the scale of, 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 a, of a city of one million inhabitants, one million and a half, which is not, not very large. We have to think bigger. This is applying those principles to the, uh, to the ground, to the territory. So you see where these actions have to be and you have there what means everything, new or old Kingston connection, an MRT, an LRT, or a BRT, and so on and so on. I'm not going to expand on those details, but um, I will probably put this presentation in my webpage, Pedro BOTs, and uh, you put Pedro BOTs Kingston, and uh, Google takes you probably uh, right to the previous presentation, and this one will be uh, uploaded tomorrow. No? Up. So, again, the you have two, two metropolis, although Stephen says that you only have one. No? I think you have the south metropolis, that is from Kingston to Mandeville, and then you have the north metropolis that goes to Montego to, to Ocho Rios, and then you have in the middle the ridge of mountains protected with a high value. And so you have two metropolis that have to work together, but as well independently, and then the protection in the middle. And that is the this green area in the middle, environmental protection, that will promote as well ecotourism, which is one of the possibilities that you have that you are not promoting enough, and I think you, you do have, with obviously a threshold of use, because you cannot make massive tourism when it's ecotourism, 
but you have that possibility. So this is my proposal for the structure of the national scale of, uh, of Jamaica. And then, is, as you see, it looks like a kite. So uh, Jamaica, take your flight. Thank you. Should I say? Thank you very much, Dr. Ortiz. Can everyone join me in another round of applause, please? Thank you. All right, so this is our Q&A section. Um, I've been monitoring the questions. I just want to reiterate because I believe some people came in after I spoke. Uh, the only way that we're going to ask questions is through the Slido website. And I'm going to ask my team to put the slide back up. The Wi-Fi password is there. The website is there. It's going to ask you for an event code. Um, and the event code is MF, as in Maris Facey, lecture. Um, we have 30 questions. We have 20 minutes in which to do this. Um, I am going to just recommend that the people who I've seen voting on Slido vote for every question. Uh, that's not how this works. Um, so I am going to encourage you to log in and pick your favorite questions. Um, if I do not address your question, we will have refreshments outside directly after this, and you will have an opportunity to interact with uh, Dr. Ortez outside. So let's and, and you can always send me an email. I have the bad uh, habitude of answering emails. Oh. And, and in the web page, you have a contact, and you can send me an email, and I will be very happy to have a discussion with you. You have no idea what you just no, said. No, 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 no. That's <laughs> fine. That's fine. I'm used to it. <laughs> okay. So let's, do, let's take the first one. Um, do you see the provision of affordable housing and green spaces, pedestrian-friendly sidewalks, as critical for current residents. This question is specific to downtown Kingston, but I really would like to expand it to the metropolis. All right. Um, it's two, two issues there, no? Is the quality of the urban environment. No, the, uh, and that is a one 500 scale. That's urban design. That's good for the architects. And you have to make a nice urban design with the parks and the pedestrians and the bicycles and the benches and all that. That's fine. Uh, no one denies that. That's great. And the other question is how to uh, be able to make affordable housing. And that will require a, a presentation of one hour. But basically, you have to structure the demand, not the needs. When you think about the needs, 20 questions, no, 30 questions, 20 minutes, that means uh, 45 seconds per question. Per question. No, no <laughs> this is an important one. No? Um, if you ask the people, do you need a house? Everyone will say yes. My daughter at 16, she needed a house. She wanted to leave um, the family. So you ask her, do you need a house? She says, well, yes. The question is, do you need a house? The question is, are you able to pay for that house? How much are you able to pay for that house? It's not the needs, it's the demand. No? And then when you have the demand, there is a lot of people which are not able to pay for the house. And that is not demand. No? And you have to provide for that. But you have to structure demand. And you have four, I hope I remember the four of them, four uh, groups. The real demand, people that have the money to buy their house, so you don't have to care about them. You have to regulate the market to avoid distortions, but you don't have to provide money for them. Then the potential demand, the guys, the families that with a bit of help, they will be able to afford a house, and then that kind of help is generally financial help, no? and so it's not very expensive. It's really 10% uh, of the cost of the house. Mm -hmm. Then you have the, uh, that, that's the name that which is missing, the, uh, uh, the, the, the demand that cannot afford a house, they really need 50% of the help, they can only pay for 50% of the house, so they, you really need to help them with 50%. That's a big chunk of people, and uh, the way you can help that is providing the land free for the building of the house, because many times 
the land is 50%, 30%, 40% of the cost of the house. So if you are able to provide that land free for that kind of housing, then you are able to provide affordable. And then there is the people that cannot afford a house in, by any way, and then the social, uh, the, the, the government really has to provide that, those houses almost for free. Never for free, but almost for free. I did the calculation in Chad about how much was needed on those groups and what much will be cost that. And in Chad, the full cost of housing the whole population of Chad was 5% of the annual oil revenue of the country. So if in Chad there are people without houses, it's not because they cannot afford it, it's because the government doesn't, doesn't care and has other priorities, I don't know which, maybe the war with, uh, with uh, uh, the neighboring country, country I don't remember, no? Uh, uh, Sudan, no? Mm -hmm. Maybe the, the war with Sudan. But really it's affordable. I made the same analysis for Bucaramanga in Colombia, and it is an effort, but it's affordable. So housing can be provided for all the population if you structure the demand and you produce different uh, strategies for each of those groups of demand, the four groups. Okay. Um, thank you for that. My favorite question here is, can you lead the planning of Jamaica's metropolises? No. <laughs> <laughs> On that vein, though, the, the primary, I think, theme here is what... What parties need to speak to each other? Who needs to be involved in the planning of the idea? Let me answer the previous question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, planning is extremely political. It's not just technical. Because we are dealing with our future, the future of all of us. And the future of all of us is not to be decided by technicians. It's, this, it's to be decided by all of us. And that is politics. So who has to lead the planning of Jamaica and Kingston, you, you know, through the people that you have elected. I don't know if the people you have elected are good or bad. I don't know about politics, about Jamaica. That's your own decision. No? But remember that we always have the politicians we deserve. Mm -hmm. And that is terrible for Spain. No? But anyway, no? because we have elected them. And if they are cheating and they are doing things wrong, is because we were not intelligent enough to be able to realize what kind of people we were electing. So we are responsible. So it is up to you to do. What I can do is to discuss, not only by internet, by email, <laughs> no, and, and try to, to, to comment with you whatever decisions you do, uh, if I think they are right or wrong. When I was in the World Bank and in institutions, my problem was that I, my message had to be the institutional message. I had to say what the World Bank wanted me to say. As a free consultant, I can say what I think. So we, you will always have from me what really I think, and not this, the institutional position of an institution that is never really the truth. No? <laughs> so you, I am at your service, so if you decide to make this kind of planning... By the way, strategic planning in Europe is made by the, the governments, but in America, is done by the chambers of commerce. Is the private sector, is the... There is something very... Sorry, this is not a question. Okay. This is an extension of the lecture. Uh, there is something extremely important that we do not take into account. No? I will finish with the private sector in America. The Chamber of Commerce are the ones that do strategic planning, that have the vision of the metropolis for the long term, because those Chamber of Commerce are going to be there in 30, 40 years' time, and the politicians are not going to be there in 30, 40 years' time. In four years, they are going to change to another job, and so on and so on. So really, it is the uh, private, the civic society that has to take into account what they want of their metropolis to be in the future. So I invite the private sector to really start a discussion about really what you want uh, from her. But then, let me go into a comment which I hope it will spring, you might disagree, but it will spring your, your thinking. Food for thought. Look, a society is composed of basically two elements, human resources and social resources. Human resources is what we all know, no? 
you are an engineer, I am an engineer, one plus one, you are a wonderful engineer, no, you are not, but they are, all right. Uh, one plus one equals two. But social resources is how we work together to produce 2.5 or 1.5 or 0.5. So human resources is knowledge, no? We need 50 engineers, we take 50 young guys, we put them in a university, we put time and money, and after 10 years we have 50 engineers. Human resources is very easy, it's just time and money. Social resources is much more difficult because it's a system of values of working together. Imagine I received the commission of a transport plan of Kingston for $100. And I'm good at roads, you are good at rails, and I tell you, let's do the plan together. And uh, I tell you, well, the commission was $50. You already know I'm cheating, that the commission was $100. And I ask you, how, much, uh, how many hours you have spent? Six hours, I spent four, so you get 60%, uh, I get 40%. If, if, if we work well together, you will get $60, I will get $40. And that is a system of values of integrating uh, professionals and politicians and the society all together. So that is high social resources. If not, if we have low social resources, I will tell you as $50, but as I got the commission, you will do the work, you know that I'm cheating, you don't know about roads, you only know about rails, it's going to be a shitty plan, and we are going to present a shitty plan, and then I'm going to keep $50, and the other 50 we will share, 25, 25, and so on, and it will be a terrible plan. That is the lack of social resources. It's a system of values. And that's why Germany uh, has a social resource capacity of 2.5. Two German engineers produce 2.5. Two Spanish engineers produce 1.5. I hope the ambassador of Spain is not around. <laughs> and two Argentinian engineers produce 0.5. So rather have one stay at home and the other. And that is called as well collective intelligence. And in a metropolis, what is worth is not the hardware. A metropolis is like a computer. You, know? you have the hardware and the software. If the hardware is only $1,000 or $2,000, no? the software is what is worth in a computer. Is what you make your life, your profession, your earnings every, every month. You know? and, this is, and the software is composed of two things. Data bank and programs. You know? Logiciel, as the French used to say. You know? The data bank is the human resources, is the knowledge, is the data, tuck, 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 all the data. The programs is the social resources, is how you relate that data to have the results you are looking for. No? So in a metropolis, we have the hardware and the software. The hardware are the, uh, the buildings, the roads, and the uh, bridges, and the software is us. And what is worth in a computer is not the hardware, $1,000. It is... I remember once I had a very small computer, and in a in a in a in an airport, someone uh, asked me, "Oh, what a nice computer! How how much does it cost?" And I said, two million dollars." No, because it's not the computer; it's, it's what is inside that really is is the worth it. No, so that is social resources, and we call that as well collective intelligence, the capacity of a group to make the right decision within a reasonable span of time. No. And that is what I, uh, it's much more difficult to develop collective intelligence because it cannot be done from outside, no? Uh, you need 50 engineers, you can uh, uh, teach them here, you can send them wherever you want and they will be, come back. Social in, uh, resources, collective intelligence, it is the society that has to decide to change the ch system of values and that can take a century. I have seen that in Spain, no? Changing the incorporation of Spain to Europe, I have been seeing that. But my point is that what is worth in a metropolis is not the building, it's you. And, and you have two aspects, human resources, what you know, and social resources, the capacity of a group to make the right decision. And for the planning of Kingston, that is essential. No? And I can give the example of Santiago de Chile, they took 17 years to build the train, but in Bogota, I told them 20 years ago where they should put the airport, and they have spent 20 years and $17 million to see that it was the right place to put the airport. That is lack of collective intelligence. And collective intelligence, there are countries like Germany, Spain, or Argentina, and there are cities as well that have or have not within a country. Medellin has collective intelligence, Bogota hasn't. 
Barcelona has collective intelligence, Madrid hasn't. I was mayor of Madrid, no? yeah. so I am not biased. Well, my bi I'm biased, but the other way, no? So really what I urge you is to build up your collective intelligence because the future of Kingston and Jamaica in the world does not depend on how much bridges or um, uh, kilometers of uh, rail or uh, highway you do. It's your capacity to make the right decisions within the uh, reasonable span of time. And I think I should fi finish there. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think we can all agree um, with those thoughts. I just want to make sure that someone captured him saying free consultation. <laughs> <All right. Yes. laughs> um, climate change is a hot topic. What is changing in these urban centers, you know, throughout the world to reduce the impact that they have on our environment? Um, and are these changes typically mandated by the government or are they led by the private sector? Nothing. I mean, uh, to change the impact of, uh, of climate change, we are doing nothing because we don't have collective intelligence worldwide to be able to, to limit uh, climate change. No? Uh, the Paris Accord was a 2% increase if we stopped all emissions uh, when that uh, decision was made. But we have 190 countries and every country do what it wants and so on. So three or four years ago, I already decided that climate change is going to come, that we are not going to be able to to stop it, so what we have is to uh, react to climate change rather than trying to stop it. It would be possible to stop it, but uh, it will require a strong international government and the United Nations is not able to do that. Anyway, so climate change, what cities are doing to, uh, to react to climate change, we have three, three solutions, and there is not more than three. There is only three. One is confrontation, the other is adaptation. The third one is running away. Huh? And the three solutions are not invented by planners. They were invented by metabolists. No, not metabolists, sorry. Paleontologists. Paleontologists. These are the three ways a species has to, to uh, adapt to a circumstances of a new predator that can eat uh, that species. Uh, uh, confrontation is uh, building a cuirass, uh, cuirass uh, uh, a protection, mm -hmm. so, so the predator will not be able to put the teeth. Uh, um, adapting is becoming uh, impossible to detect into the, uh, into the uh, forest, and running away is becoming quicker than the predator, so you are able to run away. So that's the three ways we are adapting the cities. When you have a lot of investment in the city, London, you cannot run away. You cannot take London 50 kilometers north, no? So what you do is confront. And that's the Greenwich uh, barrier that they made in the 60s, and now they are making a larger barrier because the, the sea level is going up. So confrontation. And in Venice, they are doing the same thing, trying to do the same thing. And so confrontation. That's because you have a lot of investments and you cannot have other alternatives. Then, if you have very little investment, a village in the Philippines, in, in one of the islands, that is a few houses and a few huts, then you run away. You build the village again 300 meters higher that will not be affected by... by. I'm talking about sea level rise. If you want, I talk as well about the change of, of floods and water and so on. And then adaptation. There are less examples because that's the most intelligent way, no? And so the, we... We are, no? But I give the example of Kitty Hawk in, in, in America, where they had the water that went uh, across the sand dunes into the lagoon and then back every 40 years. Now it's every three years. So what they have done is build the houses on stilts. Mm -hmm. So they park the car. When the uh, meteorologist says that uh, the water is coming, they take the car, they run away, and they come back. After two weeks, they paint the stills, and the house is perfect because the water went mm -hmm. under the house. So adaptation is the most intelligent way, but it's the most difficult, and in every case, it's a different way. So we are basically either confronting or running. By the end of the century, and I have been discussing this with professors in MIT, we are going to go not two degrees above... Uh, uh, we are going to go three or four degrees above actual... Uh, and 
as you know, sea level is speeding up. No? Now we have f uh, five millimeters every year. So in 100 years, it will be uh, uh, 50 centimeters. That's not much, but it is speeding up. And by the end of the century, we might calculate it's going to be between 1.5 and 2 meters higher. So really, there are countries in the world which are going to disappear. No? And, uh, well, 130,000 years ago, we had that temperature already. It was not our fault. Mm -hmm. we, it, it was real climate change and natural way. No? 130,000 years ago. 8,000 years ago, you, you know that from the continent you could walk to England no? because the channel was, was dry. So really, we had in the history of the world many moments of climate change. And I can go on giving examples. Some are wonderful examples. No? Where the, the paradise, the Bible paradise was, the Bible paradise is 12 meters under the sea. It's the junction of three rivers, one coming from Iran, the other, the uh, Tigris and the Euphrates, the other from Saudi Arabia. The climate was different, so there was rain in Saudi Arabia. And the paradise is 12 meters under the sea. And they have found the... Uh, capital of Krishna, the god Krishna of India, they have found the, his capital, he was king of Gujarat, and they have found it six meters under the sea as well. No? So it's, it's fascinating. But, so probably the sea level, not by the end of the century, not in 80 years, but longer, it will go up mm -hmm. uh, even more than that. And so really there are countries that are going to disappear, cities that by the seaside that are going to disappear, because normally cities in the colonizing countries, they are in the center of the country, because it was the king that controlled the country from his capital. But in colonized countries, the cities are by the seaside, because the colonizer, the only way, the only interest was extracting the goods from that country, putting them in a ship and taking them back to their uh, met metropolis, that was the name in the 19th century, to the colonizer countries. No? So, uh, in many countries of the world, the main cities are, the by, are by the seaside, and those cities are going to be inundated. No? And we will have to adapt to that. The wealthy countries, there is no problem, because any investment we do in a building, we amortize the investment in 30 years, 40 years. I, you remember what I was training, saying about the train in uh, northern Colombia? In 11 years, it's amortized, maybe 30 and so on. So when the building is amortized, we will build another one somewhere else, and we will uh, bomb that one that will become uh, under the sea a uh, place for the, uh, for the fish to... to uh, and there will be no economic problem. But the poor countries, that, that building is their only asset for the next two centuries, those poor countries are going to suffer a lot which is the way the world works. No? The wealthy get uh, well, adapt and, and the poor uh, get, get suffer it. So what are we going to do? How are we going to manage all that? Is an issue which is not technical, is not engineers or architects, is political. Is the collective intelligence of all of us the way to discuss that? Okay. All right. I agree. I have one last question <laughs> because they've been flagging us in the back for the past five minutes. Um, and I think this will encapsulate most of what the remaining questions are. If you could tell us what next three steps we should take as a nation. As what, a nation? As a nation. What, what would you say those would be? Well, I've been 16 years in politics. And I was a very bad politician because I'm not anymore in politics. No? So as a nation, really, I don't know. Well... Uh, as a metropolis, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think you have to build the system of the metropolis. And I, I, I put uh, five things that you have to do. No? The, the transport system of the uh, uh, commuter train, which is very cheap. Very cheap. If you already have the rail tracks, although you told me that they have been invaded. No, oh, that's a problem because even if they don't have legal rights, they have human rights. And to get rid of those human rights, you have to pay and so on, so it might be more expensive. But if you already have the rights of way of a commuter train, it's cheaper than a BRT. A BRT costs $7 million per kilometer, and a commuter train, is, if you have the, the rights of way, is $5 million per kilometer. So you should be thinking, I don't know if it has to be next year or in the next 15 years, but you have to, because you have to build the territory around the stations, and you already have to create the demand 
for those commuter trains around the stations by creating high-density housing. No? Then the protection of the environment, the continuity of the environment, and then the system of, of road instead of being radial to being reticular to avoid uh, to, 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 to be able to work it in, in this kind of chess game and so on. As a nation related to metropolis, I don't mm -hmm. know about the debt mm -hmm. of the nation that you are paying and about all these mm -hmm. things, I, I don't know. But as a nation, if I would create, I would uh, have a delegate for the southern metropolis and a delegate for the northern metropolis whose role will be coordinating the investments of the ministers that are made. Look, the mayors do not have the money to uh, address the needs of a metropolis. No? Uh, I've been told that you are the, rate, the ratio of the public sector uh, versus the private sector in, in, in Jamaica is around 30%. No? That is fine. There are countries that the public sector is only 10%. Those countries cannot work. 30% is the limit of efficiency from 30 to 50. So you can have the investment. But the, the proportion of money which is in central government and the local authorities is enormous. No? The money is owned by the central government that gets the uh, RARS and so on and so on. And the local authorities have very little. But as a matter of fact, in Guatemala, a local authority has $40 per year per person. In the United States, they have $14,000 per year per person. In India, $2 per year per person. I don't know what's the uh, number in, in Jamaica, but that will be very interesting. With $2 per year per person, you can do nothing, not even sweep the, uh, the streets, no? So really the one that has the money to do the infrastructure and the housing and the policies in the metropolis is central government. So the, the guy which is in charge of the metropolis is the prime minister, he's not the mayors, he's not the worms, the bunch of worms, he's the snake. No? So I would have some kind of organization that will coordinate the investments that central government is making in the, in the metropolis, the hospital, the roads, and so on and so on, to make it consistent with a vision that will work for the whole metropolis instead of each of them doing whatever they think you know, without that vision. And with all the questions, I've been here one day and a half and I have many meetings, all the questions were about the small dimension, were mm -hmm. about the 1500, were about what do we do with the redefinition of the old uh, uh, center or mm -hmm. the... Uh, think big, no? You have to think about all the scales and integrate them, no? So, so really that vision for the metropolis, the north metropolis, the south metropolis, and the center of the country, I think is necessary, and that will be my suggestion to the prime minister that I have not met him, but I would love to do. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So... Just so just so everyone knows, as as Dr. T says, there's gonna his he's gonna put the slides up on his website. We will also be putting video clips up on our social media for the CB Basie Foundation, um, so you'll be able to check back to some of the most important things that he said, including free consultation. Um, as I said, they, I think we only got four questions in. There are a lot left. He's going to be outside. He will join us for refreshments. Please do not overwhelm him because we would like him to come back. Um, he will answer your emails. And on top of that, we have kept a record of the questions that were submitted. Um, and we will try to address them in a manner in which we can share with the public. Um, before we break, and I know this is when everybody packs up to leave, and I can already see one of my favorite people doing that. Um, I have to thank some people because an event of this magnitude does not come together easily. It takes, it takes work. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank Pedro. Thank you to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think his global insights have been incredibly valuable. I've seen a lot of people taking notes. Um, and I think the key takeaway for us here is that to move forward, we have to do so collectively. That has been the, on the, the, the theme of his, of his presentation. Um, next, I want to thank Anna Ward and Emma Miles, um, two women who work for the CB Facey Foundation and who have perfectly embodied um, our saying, Wilikobot Wetalawa. 
Um, next, breakthrough communications and all of the volunteers from Panjam and Jamaica Property who we have seen with the white t-shirts with the logos on them. Um, and then, of course, our partners, the Urban Development Corporation, um, and in particular, the fantastic team at the Jamaica Conference Center who have hosted us. Um, the Kingston Restoration Company, the University of Technology's Caribbean School of Architecture, the Jamaica Institute of Architects, the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, um, and Capri in particular, Shamoy Kane, who has helped us with the Slido facility. Um, I would really like to thank you, the audience. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and I challenge you to continue these conversations and work towards achieving the goals that we have discussed here today. Um, and last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank Maris Facey, who is a visionary and a patriot, and a man who took action to obtain long-term benefits for all. May we aspire to do the same. Thank you all for coming.